So it's my pleasure to be here, and thanks to organizers for making this meeting. I find it very interesting because it's opened by computer scientists talking about biology. Then we have some biologists talking about computer science and mathematics, and uh, it was great. It means that we are becoming interdisciplinary uh, community, and uh, that uh, we can talk and productively, productively work with each other. Uh, I have been in this business for more than 20 years now, and uh, I can tell you I have met some old friends here. I have met some people that I knew but never met before, and it was a great pleasure. And I also met some new people, so it's very nice to see that we are building community. I'll be talking about big data analytics and uh, how we use it uh, for vaccine development. I'll take a few words because obviously people are wondering, at least those who know me, what am I doing in Kazakhstan? Uh, Kazakhstan is just next stage of my life and uh, uh, Nazarbayev University is a national university uh, and uh, it is a new one so I went there to help build new university we have uh, four undergraduate schools I'm the dean of the biggest school School of Science and Technology and uh, we have several graduate schools and the idea is to help Kazakhstan reform the education and medical system and I'm very happy to do that, to be part of this. And uh, we have just recruited our first Nobel Prize winner, so it's serious business and I'm quite happy to tell it. This is the main hall of the university and uh, my office is in that wing. And we are still building university, about only one quarter of the buildings are ready by now. Okay, let's go to business. Uh, I'll talk, uh, I'll give some introduction about immunity and vaccines, talk about big data and uh, introduce the systems that we are using and then I will talk about applications, what we did in practice. I'm a very applied person, so I develop all these uh, predictive models based on mathematics and uh, all different kinds of statistical approaches. And uh, the biggest pleasure is when we see it working, and I will show you some examples of that. So to repeat what has been talked about last two days is about antigens, and I will run this video because I got it from YouTube, and this is about antigens, so let's see. I think that volume is not working here. Let's check. Uh, we have taken, uh, how about volume? I would like to have volume on.
So this is a very simplified uh, s description of how immune system works, but uh, this also captures the main principles. So what we have here is we have helper T cells, with help regulation. We have B cells and killer T cells, which are two arms of adaptive immunity. And I found that immunologists are similar to mathematicians in a particular way. You know that mathematicians, pure mathematics and applied mathematics, they don't really talk to each other. They live in different worlds. And people in immuno immunologists who develop vaccines, uh, they also have two camps, cellular T cell based and B cell based, antibody based. And they also don't talk to each other. You go to one meeting and say, hey, there is T cell immunity, they say it's irrelevant for vaccines. It's only antibody. And there will be the other side that tells. And in reality, we need both arms. And it is known that natural, natural immunity after infection provides longer lasting and stronger immunity. And uh, if we immunize with some unit that induce only antibodies, we know that uh, it is not as strong. So both combined together work uh, uh, in our defense. And uh, you can see it in a simplistic way that antibodies prevent cells from getting infected by the pathogen. So they operate outside of the cell. And once when cells get infected, T cells clear. So working together, they have much better effect. Okay, now about big data as our introduction. So the promise of big, big data is that, you know, this is another hype word, you know, you're talking about big, big data. And uh, basically, this comes from Harvard School of Public Health. This is where I was. I was at Harvard Medical School before that. So our colleagues published that. And they said that petabytes of raw information could provide clues for everything. That sounds great, doesn't it? Clues for everything. From TB, preventing tuberculosis to shrinking health care costs. I think it's a really great promise. So give me money and I will do everything for you. Okay, so the reality is the total data doubles every two years. This is similar to Moore's law, doubles every two years. And in the last five years, more scientific data has been generated than in the entire preceding history of humankind. Talk about recorded. Uh, digital records should make life easier for doctors and bring down costs for providers and patients uh, and improve the quality of care. This is wishful thinking. Actually, it increases cost because of the transition into data intensive. And in the long run, it may decrease it. In a world of big data, the correlations surface almost by themselves. I don't believe in that. We still need to do proper work and organize data and look at that. But there is this idea that we just throw this data in a program and they will give us results. Uh, by the time I finish this lecture, the amount of new information generated, new data generated by human race will expand by about 100 petabytes. This is all the slides from six months ago. So now it's 100 petabytes. And uh, this is about double of all written works from beginning of recorded history in all languages. So it's bigger than British Library. And uh, one hour only. Ten years ago, if we wanted to do the single genome, it was billions of dollars. We had this in one of the presentations. And today, we can do thousands of individual genomes at anything between 1,000 and 10,000. And I don't know what this number means. 4.75 exabytes of data will store total genome of all people on Earth. These are numbers. I, I, I cannot comprehend how big these numbers are. So, what is big data? Is it wishful thinking? I see those statements have a wishful thinking. Costs will go down or patterns will emerge by themselves. There is also cures all. I have answer for everything. You know, you know this story about snake oil that tricks. I, actually, what is that? There is this black balsam cures everything, right? And I think it's in reality this is a real opportunity. But we need to do it systematically and properly. So big data is, indeed, we are in data-driven era. So uh, there was hypothesis-based research. Now we have data-based research. Let's, let's find some patterns in our data and try to work out what they mean. 
and uh, we have enterprise size big data platforms. What is the biggest enterprise uh, platform that we are using today? Anybody knows? Baidu, Google, better platforms. They integrate everything and make access to this, and uh, they even uh, have the keys for indexing this, and we can do very big searches. And we all do it, whether we know it or not. Then we have predictive and content analytics. This is where we try to make sense out of that. And uh, this all drives our decision. So we manage our decision based on access to this data and getting information. And challenges is whether we are asking the right questions. What is that we are really asking? What assumptions do we have? We have unstructured data. At best, it's semi-structured. And uh, we have huge volumes of data. And we are hoarding data. They are coming and... We, we, you know, it's like those people who bring things into their homes and there is no space for anything else, but they can't get rid of anything. And, uh, of course, this is all mantra in computer science. Bad data comes in, bad results come out. And uh, we need to have adequate data, tools, people, and management. Uh, more than half of big data projects fail. So we are talking about field that fails largely, and these are the reasons for. And very interesting is that difficulties with big data project is finding the right talent. We don't have people who can do it properly. Matching tools with the need and understanding key issues. So people who work on big data, they typically don't understand what are the key issues. So we have about... 75% of those who run the project, they don't understand what it is. So we need more education in there. And the rest is standard. like. But poorly defined scope is also in 60%. So a lot of people who talk about that, they don't know what they're talking about. Anyway, so this is... Bigger data are not necessarily better data. The more the better doesn't apply here. And not all data are of equal value. Some are more accurate, some are better granularity, some are complete, and uh, some, are, some data are in, insufficient to make any conclusions. And uh, the question that we have to see, to, to ask is what and why? Because uh, if we find a pattern in data, it can be described in multiple ways. And I was talking with uh, Yoram, where is he? Back in Israel. Back in Israel, uh, he doesn't like my talk. Right? He knew what I was going to talk about. And basically, he tries to explain this thing, uh, this thing about uh, viruses. It's a good work. I like it a lot. But the question is that we are picking only the most aggressive viruses. We are not picking those which are moderate or low uh, infectivity, because this is the nature of how we collect this data. So what is the implication of that? And then how do we interpret, interpret the data? Because these data have limits, they have biases, we have assumptions that are actually biasing our analysis, and very often we are enamored by a hypothesis so much that we forget things that, and we say this is not a good experiment, we'll ignore it. it happens very often. And we have privacy and ethical issue when we talk about biomedical data. And uh, influenza vaccines, we already, I think, we saw it a couple of times. Francesco showed this data. We have a lot of HLA sequences. We have a lot of influenza sequences that we know. Uh, we have uh, HLA class and two variants. And uh, we have 10 to the 20 possible HLA profiles. And it's more than the number of humans on Earth that ever lived. So theoretical number is not what we have. And uh, at the moment, we have only 10 to the 4 profiles. So we can see that there is a huge gap in what we have the data and the, what we call search space. The same thing here with the nightmare peptides that Francesco mentioned. We only have 10 to the 5 nightmare peptides in all influenza viruses. And we don't know which new ones will appear. And uh, we have similar situation with B-cell epitopes. So basically our knowledge is order of magnitude smaller than what is the search space. And this is an interesting thing. So what is big data analytics? So it's an analysis of uh, data sets that are so large or complex that traditional data processing applications are not adequate. And they have challenges, right? 
And this is from Wikipedia. So these are data sets so large or complex that traditional applications are not adequate. I translate into, into that data mining is redefined by those who are new in the data mining field. This is exactly the same thing that we had for data mining and we were developing tools for a specific problem. And what adequate means, I, I don't know because uh, we are solving those problems as they come. So, we use knowledge-based systems for this, and uh, we have published recently this uh, Big Data Analytics in Immunology paper, and uh, this basically says about the uh, complexity of the problem that we have here, and uh, it is uh, variability, uh, variability in pathogens is one problem, and the uh, host immune system variability. So we need to match targets with the host, and then we have data analysis tools, HLA profiling, pathogen variability analysis tools. So we are piping this data into tools that are digesting them. And then we are identifying antigenic peptides or three-dimensional structures, and prediction of antigenicity. And then we have binding assays, we have mass spectrometry and other things. And then pathogen knowledge basis uh, is that where we put uh, data from primary database and the literature. And literature is pretty much everything that we can access on the internet. It doesn't have to be published uh, in, in, in some journal to be a document that we are using. So this is, uh, from that we try to conclude vaccine targets which is suitable for that. And uh, when we organize the pipeline, you can see that we have different modules. We get, get, get this unstructured and scattered data, which are in primary database and different types of publications. Then we have automated data collection and processing. Then we have uh, data cleaning, enrichment, and annotation. So basically, we are telling, taking this data and putting it into a structured format. And then we can use all these tools that already exist, and we can adapt them to new problems. Then we have uh, uh, import of data in the central repository because it needs to be standardized. Then integration of basic analysis tools so that we can automate the analysis. And uh, after that, we integrate specialized analysis tools. And typically, we have to develop new tools for each of the problem that we are adding. So we have generic tools that we integrate and new tools that we add. And then uh, we define workflow for integrated analysis and build a knowledge base. So these are all the steps about this data, which are so big that we cannot use all the, all, all the traditional tools. And we have those steps to make it uh, useful with traditional analysis tools. And then we have semi-automated update and maintenance of the database. And we have examples here, key, keyword search and, and refinement uh, uh, keyword search, sequence similarity searches, and so on. We have those examples. Conceptual foundation is about we have a lot of data, but we have very little knowledge and wisdom. So we have hierarchy of knowledge, data, which are just labels, just instances. Information is when we label data. For example, if I spell 56, would you know what that is? It's a piece of data. Well, 56 could be my age. You say my age is 56. Then it starts getting certain meaning. And then you can start making conclusions about it, or at least predictions. And uh, knowledge is that, oh, if I'm more than 50 years old, I should do a medical check because uh, chronic diseases, if captured at early 50s, they're much more easily treated and my health will be better. Suddenly, we are applying knowledge to the fact that I have accumulated here, this simple example. And wisdom is that if I am overweight, I should watch my sugar and all kinds of things. So this is a simple example, but you can imagine that we have these kind of issues in any project. And the knowledge that we have is not necessarily trivial as what we know about individual human health. And uh, the quantity of data, of course, is much bigger. There is a lot of data, the preciously little wisdom. And acquisition cost is the opposite. So it costs us a lot to make this con uh, conclusion. So it's very easy to collect the data, but to make sense of it, it's a huge process. And we have knowledge gap, knowledge between, uh, gap between information and knowledge, and we have application gap. Because even if we have knowledge, how do we make application, computational modeling application that can help us make, make decision and become wise. 
And the after application of computational uh, methods and bioinformatics and modeling, we are actually narrowing those gaps. So this is pretty much where we are operating. And uh, I have defined this new, uh, the first one came from uh, librarians, because they, they were managing data and information. And uh, uh, we have this uh, hierarchy, which is I call data to vision. And uh, I call wisdom is understanding of systems and frameworks. And uh, understanding is when we know what the model and mechanism and structure is. And, and wisdom, when we can put this knowledge into frameworks and systems. But vision is ability to design. So if you think about uh, penicillin, of course, the data was that there was observation, but there was this wisdom and vision to make a drug that can treat people. And this is another trivial example, and we have non-trivial examples that we deal here in our field every day. So, immunology and big data. Immunology equals complexity. We already have heard that. And we have immune disorders, infectious disease, autoimmunity, cancer, allergies. Each, each of these fields is huge. It's way bigger than each of us can, can work with. And uh, what we have is that largest diversity, T cell receptors, antibodies, cytokines, all of these things, antibodies and T cell receptors, they have bigger diversity than any other genetic system in our body. Orders of magnitude bigger. So we have to deal with something which is more complex than the genome, way more complex. And then, on top of that, immune system interacts with all other systems. Think about immune disorders, autoimmunity. And uh, it is intelligent system because it learns and it has memory. So it's perfect system. I, uh, the word is that this is the second most complex system, uh, living system after the brain. So if you want to map vaccine targets experimentally, it's very challenging. Large chance of pathogen proteomes. Uh, so sequence length versus sequence number variants. There is a highly poly poly polymorphic uh, immune system, HLA molecules, and uh, T cell epitopes, they have low prevalence, 1 to 5% for any given of HLA molecule, maybe even 0.1. And uh, we have a very small number of non neutralizing antibodies. It doesn't go in numbers. They're well defined, more than 20 for best uh, defined diseases. And uh, there is high cost of peptide synthesis. Even if the numbers, uh, the cost per peptide goes lower, we want to screen more peptides. And uh, another big problem is that it's, we have limited access to human samples. If we want to do experimental testing, we spend our sample. And then we run out, if it, and what, what then? So we need to minimize the effort, uh, the, the amount of sample that we, we can use. And uh, it's, of, of course, time consuming uh, and uh, very expensive. So applications, how do we deal with that? <clears throat> One thing is that we have developed a framework for rapid development of database that has all this module that I mentioned before. So what I said in theoretical uh, sense, we have these modules, automated data extraction and passing them into X XML format. Then manual data cleaning and annotation, import of data into central repository. Again, this is standardization of this data so that we can apply the analytical tools. Uh, then integration of basic analytical tools and development of specialized needed for a particular project. And then we define workflow, <coughs> workflow specific research question. For example, if we develop vaccine against influenza or dengue virus, we need different tools because there are four serotypes of dengue virus and we have vaccines that has to be tetravalent, has to protect against all four serotypes because it, the nature of dengue is that primary infection is not dangerous, but secondary infection has very severe effects and particularly young children and uh, elderly die from that. So it is not exactly the same as influenza. Influenza is a problem that new unknown strains appear in epidemics, it's, uh, they do it by mutation, by antigenic uh, drift, but then we have every now and then recombination that comes and can be quite deadly. Luckily, when we had swine flu a few years back, it was very mild. Actually, the num number of people who died was quite large, but percentage-wise was not. And a lot of people got immunity against similar vi viruses in the future. Anyway, so we have all these modules, 
workflows for specific research question, and then we have what we call next generation immunological database or knowledge base, and then we can uh, update it and we can run it and uh, extract knowledge from that. Architecture is that we have data collection from primary database and from the web, from literature. We perform data cleaning, which is uh, now it's almost automated, and uh, we use data enrichment from the literature. So this is the key about how we put things together. And uh, one of the uh, one of the enrichment, uh, for example, was functional functional results about. Uh, uh, different targets. And then it goes into local repository, and then we apply the tools. We can do summarization, classification, regression, cl clustering, all these statistical approaches. And then we validate this data, refine it, extract the knowledge. So it's data mining. And then workflow is that we need to get concepts and basic science right. Then we need to integrate data tools and models peptide binding, protein analysis, database, knowledge bases. We perform simulations and predictions. Predictive models require that. And then we, find, we use them to find vaccine targets. We have missing proteins from mass spectrometry runs and uh, so on. We do validation experiment coming to Fran Francesco, what, what he said. We need to do computational analysis. We need to validate it and feed this data back. And then we have to interpret, and out of that we design products. So how about doing this for T cell epitopanon? Remember, two branches, two arms, the one that kills cells that are already infected, and the other one that prevents infection of the cell by pathogen. So T cell epitop, so we, we designed this flu KB. This is influenza vaccine target discovery knowledge base, and we also did Flavi, Flavi DB. This is for Flavi viruses, and we applied it for dengue virus vaccine. And uh, what we did is we performed conservation analysis of dengue virus T-cell epitope-based vaccine candidates using peptide block entropy. We developed a new tool, which is called peptide block entropy. Uh, those who are in bioinformatics know what is sequence-based entropy. And what we did is we extended and we say we do it for the blocks of the sequence, things that we try to compare. And uh, it's the same principle, but uh, it gives us additional information. And then this is how we organize the data. Again, this is uh, similar to what I already showed. We use IDB. This was mentioned in the first day as one of the databases. We use data from PDB, structural database, Uniprot and GeneBank for sequences. We perform data cleaning and then we use literature to enrich this data, basically put more annotations, annotations which are needed for this problem and put it in the... So what we start, started, we have 70 species of hosts and then uh, 12,000, 13,000 entries, 184 T-cell epitopes, 201 reported B-cell epitopes, four protein structures, and after cleaning, we removed data artifacts, 512 consolidated dictionary items so that the names are consistent in 1,000, uh, uh, consolidated redundant entries, uh, corrected misclassified species, and uh, uh, we identify mistyped serotypes. And you can imagine if you don't do it, we'll have errors in, in any conclusion. It's very important to get this. So we actually got an improved uh, things by using text mining with entries and uh, sequence protein annotation was only 30 percent we got it to 100 percent but the missing part is pathology we couldn't get pathology related data and we needed to, to go basic to, to other literature and uh, anyway so this is uh, this is what happens when we when we do the data mining. So we did block entropy analysis, which means that we go for sequence alignment. Again, Francesco mentioned about tools for that. And then we define blocks. And block one has three different peptides in this. Uh, block two has four different peptides. And uh, dengue virus one through four, four stereotypes all together, they have 3,392 blocks of length nine and there is 53,300 peptides to consider. So you can see how we have data explosion here. And imagine, now we need to start analyzing them for all human HLAs. So we need to multiply with thousands. 
In each individual, we have six different uh, alleles. So we, it, it's just combinatorial explosion if you are looking what is applicable to individual. So what we did is we did blocks conservation, analyzed that and put the line here. We say for vaccine design, what is important is the only places where you don't have more than five, more than five T cell potential epitopes, because if you have diversity, vaccines are not likely to be efficient. And then uh, we have 1,500 blocks that cover 99% of dengue with five or less peptides. So we identify those regions, these are those peaks which are under the red line. And then when we looked at their HLA specificity, we found that some of them are not predicted as binders, some of them have good binding affinity, and adding this data actually uh, reduces it to useful peptides. So we started reducing the number of peptides. And uh, this is the block logo. This is uh, what normal information comes, but when we look at block entropy, we get information like this. So here we, we see that there are four different possible variants in this peptide here, and two different, which makes eight possibilities, but we can see that in reality there is not more than four. So by looking at this, we can actually focus on peptides as targets. Well, this is uh, an interesting approach that we have done because uh, we also played a little bit. My dream was that we want to do automatic knowledge discovery. And what is better than generating uh, something that can result in a patent? So we said we are not going to do the analysis. We'll build a system and we run the analysis and we got patentable results. And actually this result about conserved peptide blocks in homologous polypeptides is uh, in process of uh, being granted a patent. And this is what was generated automatically through our system. So I think we had, we had great fun. And this is first time that one of my students has a first publication was patent application. And it was really nice. Okay, so block entropy and its implementation is a discovery tool. So we developed this new tool and it can analyze diversity of T-cell epitopes, but it can also analyze B-cell epitopes. We are coming to these things that B-cell epitopes are three-dimensional. So we need to make a trick to make three-dimensional structure linear that we can use it. And we can use it for multiple things. And what we have done is we made what we call virtual peptide, this continuous peptide. So this B-cell epitope was identified by, uh, and it was done mathematically very formally. Uh, this was identified from crystal structure. This is, a, this is antibody binding to the stem of hemagglutinin. And then uh, we define this and then define the, the positions. And we can see there is huge diversity here, but in reality we don't have many uh, B-cell epitope variants, not as many as we would get by multiplying those positions, because a lot of those things don't exist in nature. And we have identified virtual peptides that are representative of B-cell epitopes, and then we looked at their functional properties, whether they're neutralized by the antibody or escape variant, or we don't know. And we have cataloged all this. We also looked not only at B-cell epitope, but we looked at the neighboring Residues, and we found out that uh, they're pretty well conserved. Those which have the, this particular species, most of those sequences will have uh, the same neighborhood as well. So we found out that actually a small number of B-cell epitopes is involved in there. And then we published this, uh, uh, it was only last year, and we did larger scale analysis of B-cell epitopes on influenza hemagglutinin. And then we looked at uh, cross-reactivity of neutralizing antibodies. So there are 22 antibodies that we studied. And we studied them all in parallel. We just uh, make a, one huge run. And again, this is big data analyst, analytics because we take all the data, pipe it through the system, and get the results uh, which are required. And uh, we, we hear that there are 70 influenza A serotypes. So we took them into groups, analyzed uh, with this uh, antibodies, and uh, also mapped all other antibodies on the, so some of them of these neutralizing antibodies, uh, they target the head of hemagglutinin, some are on the stem. And we mapped them, all of them, and did the analysis. And what we did is we distinguished those which are neutralized and cross-neutralized versus those that are not. And we cataloged all the values there. The result is that we could get the list of B-cell epitopes 
and we can find their neutralization status. And we have sequences that determine them and now that we can compare them across. And what we found out is that actually most of the sequences that we have are not studied in neutralizing antibody assays. So people actually cover only 20% of what is available there. And I'm not surprised that we don't have vaccines against emerging viruses. If we were studying 80% or 90% of what is there, we would have much better knowledge what is going on. And this is uh, the showing things that uh, we, we have different uh, uh, antibodies here, not only, and we have the subtypes, representative subtypes of those actually B cell epitopes, and we can see that the most of them are unknown. And it is not very difficult to put this in assays. This is not, the, the whole total cost of those complete neutralizing assays will not be three times bigger than what people are spending now, but they're doing incomplete work. And this is the irony of that. People are just making their wild guesses, and we have results that tell exactly what, uh, what has to be studied. And we found that uh, there is only 17% of uh, influenza viruses that don't have any neutralizing antibody studies, but all the rest has either one neutralizing antibody, two, or all the way up to seven. And we can see that uh, about 31%, one third of the total, is covered by four different neutralizing antibodies. One third of all influenza is covered by that. Well, so this tells us where we are. So we have discovery tools, and uh, our discovery tool is this automation workflow. So we have database, knowledge base, we select the sequence, we classify species, then we get new sequences, then we query the sequence, we find P cell epitope, P cell epitope analysis, and we have conservation of variability analysis and just put them together. It's trivially simple when we put it at this level because we have those tools. And I see this as we have the ability to simulate experiments that are done in laboratory and we can do millions of them within minutes, tens of millions, and we can integrate the data and we can select experiments which will actually produce useful knowledge. And we, I believe that we have succeeded to merge now analysis for both humoral and cellular arm of immunity. And I think uh, we are about to break through into vaccine uh, design with this. And the research pipeline, we have infrastructure, we have basic tools, keywords, sequence similarity, multiple sequence alignment. We have data sets, tumor T-cell antigen, flavivirus, human papilloma virus, Merkel cell polyoma virus, EBV, influenza virus antigens. So databases are available, easy to do. And we have advanced analysis tools, mutation maps, HLA binding prediction on the fly, uh, variability analysis, block entropy analysis, variability analysis of T-cell epitopes, and B-cell epitope analysis. And uh, we have workflows uh, that are developed. And once when we create a workflow, it is very easy, very fast to do that. Of course, we need to modify it for new, new, new problems, but this is, uh, this is actually can be produced. So we have 400,000 influenza sequences, about 300 HLA alleles that we consider, and we can perform global analysis of T-cell epitopes, global analysis of neutralizing B-cell epitopes, and we are, I, I believe that we are ready for universal vaccines, because we now there is antibody versus T-cell paradigm, people don't talk, but we say no. We have both, and they can be put together. And I think it's time to talk about polyvalent vaccines, which are more not, not only two constructs, but have five or ten different constructs that will provide broader coverage. And of course, getting it into vaccine is a different story, but I think this knowledge helps us go into a proper direction. And I'm actually establishing now research centers at Nazarbayev University. In conclusion, we are indeed in the era of big data, and it happened once when we got computers into research. And this is just continuation, and the, the, the trend is the same. And getting value from big data requires significant effort in creating infrastructure for analysis and asking the right questions, having proper tools. And knowledge-based systems offer methods and tools for discovery and extraction of knowledge, and automation of these processes enables meaningful use of this data and inter interpre interpretation of results. So we have analyzed a complete set of all non-influenza sequences, 
and we identified groups of targets for cross protection and we also put it in human population profiles. And uh, I think that uh, we are ready for complete shift into universal vaccine research based on complete current knowledge. But somebody says, okay, we have M1 protein on influenza, and because it's shared, between, it's very conserved, we use it as a target. The problem is, as Yoram said, is this is the last protein that gets assembled, and once, when we attack this, viruses have already been infecting other cells. So it doesn't matter, this cell is already exhausted and will die anyway. So universal vaccine is not about having uh, one pepper that is shared. Universal vaccine is about covering all possible viruses, all possible humans, and all possible human populations in a meaningful way. And uh, I want to say thanks to my group, Wang Lan and Jing San, Lars Olsen, Christian Simon, and Lord Kudal. And uh, this work uh, spans multiple institutions, A star in Singapore, Nanyang Technology University, Dana-Farber Dana Cancer Institute, and Boston University. These are all my previous employers. And Jing San from Tongji University in Shanghai, and Dana-Farber. And Lars, Chris, Christian, and Ulrich are from DTU, Danish Technical University. And uh, there are quite a few other people who contributed, but I cannot list their names. There are too many. And the institution involved in this work, Walter and Liza Hall Institute in Melbourne, Australia, Institute for Infocom Research, Singapore, National Uni University of Singapore, Nanyang Technological University, Dana Farber Cancer Institute, University of Queensland, Boston University, and Nazarbayev University now. So you can see institution change, but people stay the same. Projects goes on. Thank you. So good morning, colleagues. Um, it is real pleasure for me to be on such a meeting. Um, uh, since we worked uh, in the field of mathematical modeling some time ago, and uh, now I think it is a very good uh, time to revive uh, this uh, exper experience and. Uh, I already got some new ideas um, and found some collaborations. Uh, initially, I was uh, supposed to talk, or I, I wanted to talk just about uh, our work uh, on modeling of signaling pathways in macrophages, uh, but uh, yesterday I didn't hear any talk uh, about macrophages or any uh, significant uh, story from innate immunity, so I decided to make uh, uh, longer, more extensive introduction on macrophages. Fortunately, today in the first talk, uh, the, the nice movie you saw, you saw the function of macrophages uh, antigen presenting cells. If we would be on immuno pure immunology meeting, this wouldn't be a macrophage, this would be a dendritic cells. This is uh, another big pleasure for me um, uh, that it is called macrophage here. So um, then let me first uh, give some brief introduction on the innate immunity in general. Uh, so the functions uh, of innate immunity is detection of pathogens, injury, activation of complement cascade uh, that is very well studied, uh, regulation of infl inflammatory reaction um, that is also quite well described since many decades, removal of foreign substances and activation of adaptive uh, immunity. So, I, I'm not talking about adaptive immunity here uh, at all, since uh, we had so many nice talks about it. So, the cells of uh, innate immunity are very diverse. So, you have macrophages, uh, mast cells, neutrophils, uh, MK cells, and uh, among those, the macrophages uh, seem to be the most uh, versatile. So, you find them in every organ, in every tissue. Uh, they look different. They uh, have, to a certain extent, different functions. Uh, they even got different names due to their morphology and uh, due to their appearance the, under the microscope. Uh, what do they uh, do in the body, uh, in your everyday life? Uh, first of all, if uh, the organism is healthy, uh, macrophages are still active just uh, to keep it in this uh, condition. So they control tissue turnover, they control cytokine concentration, they prevent inflammation as long as it is not needed, and they control the appearance of uh, transformed cells and remove them if, uh, if they appear. 
Uh, as soon as something happens, macrophages go into activated state and uh, start to control uh, the complete immunity or initiate uh, all the immune reactions. Uh, and not only initiate, but also uh, check as, uh, when, when is the time point when the inflammation is not needed anymore. So they turn into another functional state and initiate the healing processes to return the organism to homeostasis. Uh, sounds uh, very complex and very interesting functions, uh, but uh, now, although I was supposed probably to switch these two parts, uh, a little bit of history. So, the macrophages are the cells that were described more than 100 years ago by Mishnikov, and uh, I, I always put this citation of his uh, Nobel lecture uh, that says that every time organism uh, enjoys or uses immunity, there is a phagocyte somewhere behind it. So that means uh, there is nearly no uh, immune reactions without phagocytes. Now this was the first discovery. It took uh, uh, nearly uh, 50 years, or more than 50 years, uh, until the macrophage activation was described, and uh, even more. Uh, you don't need to read all this, uh, but this is really a very interesting study that showed that uh, macrophages provide for immunological memory. It is not uh, the immunological memory we have from adaptive immunity, but it is some kind of a short-time memory that protects you from the pathogen uh, for the certain time after an infection is healed. Another 20 years, and the, factors, uh, the first factor activating macrophages was described. So we moved to molecular era, and uh, interferon gamma was identified as the factor that, uh, that activate macrophages uh, and provide them the factor exceder activity. And one more decade, uh, the house started in the macrophage field. So, uh, Simon Gordon described uh, interleukin-4 as uh, alternative activator of macrophages, introduced this term, showed uh, the first molecular marker for this, it was a macrophage monot receptor, and actually introduced a concept uh, of uh, a macrophage activation dichotomy. So, his suggestion was uh, that the macrophages that are classically activated and that have uh, the bactericidal activity and alternatively activated macrophages that do not have this activity. So then during several years uh, this concept uh, developed a bit um, and uh, developed in a way that uh, no mathematician would accept, uh, I believe. Uh, but what uh, it was suggested that every stimulus that is related to inflammation causes the classical activation of macrophages, and the, the whole bunch of markers was uh, suggested. Whatever uh, suppresses the inflammatory activity, or some inflammatory activities uh, of macrophages, was considered to be uh, alternative activators of macrophages. So you can find here different cytokines, you can find here hormones also, uh, and also some receptors were, or some, some markers for this activation were suggested. Uh, so just for the normal uh, human understanding, uh, it is really hard to believe that uh, such a different uh, stimuli can induce the same macrophage phenotype. So this induced uh, very active uh, research in which uh, I also participated a lot. And um, what actually we end up with uh, uh, was uh, this picture uh, that shows us that whatever stimulus you take, uh, it goes uh, the very specific macrophage phenotype. Uh, for some of them, we were able to show um, the functions or specific functions they can do better than the others. Uh, but I can believe uh, that this is far not uh, everything what can be uh, done with these macrophages, or, and also not all the functions uh, that they um, can do. So it's just a work of one lab, and uh, we cannot do really everything what can be done with macrophages. Uh, I'm not going to show you all the concepts uh, that were uh, developed for the macrophages. I will just uh, give you this, uh, the beginning of the table, uh, published last year, end of last year in Immunity, um, that suggests uh, an approach to classify macrophages and to deal with their names and phenotypes. Uh, so basically here we have um, um, 
problem that comes from uh, different uh, sides. First of all, these are really strongly diverse experimental systems that are used, and uh, macrophages, these are the cells that are very different than mouse and human. Uh, these are differences uh, in, uh, in the way macrophages are uh, obtained from the uh, mouse or from human or generated uh, from mouse and human. Uh, and uh, also, there are specific stimuli used to differentiate monocytes into macrophages, like interleukin-4, interleukin-10, glucocorticoids, and TGF-beta. And at the same time, the researchers write uh, that there is a continuum of functional states. So this, uh, uh, this triangle should indicate this continuum, although these are really totally different stimuli in here. So, uh, to my opinion, um, the field is uh, extremely chaotic now and uh, needs uh, some additional um, opinions, maybe even really from a mathematical point of view, uh, to be able to uh, to classify or to uh, structure the situation. So, but uh, one thing can be uh, concluded from this, very simple thing, that first of all, that every stimulation induces a unique phenotype of macrophages. And uh, it's not only the type of stimulus, but also their combination is important because some of them are in part antagonistic, uh, some of them are 100% or nearly 100% antagonistic. Uh, so, when you have a combination, uh, then you get uh, increase of, uh, of complexity of the whole system, and it has to be taken into account. So, the next level of complexity comes uh, with a fourth dimension, that means the sequence of events and the timing of the events. Uh, this was one of the questions that, uh, that we were asked uh, on many congresses when we were showing just the phenotypic diversity. And then we designed very simple experiments. So uh, we got this, uh, the very original type 2 macrophages and very original type 1 macrophages and gave them an opposing stimulus. So just a very simple experiment. Uh, but uh, the result we got uh, was also quite logical. So uh, macrophages uh, cannot be considered as terminally differentiated cells. Uh, therefore, the result was that, yes, they do respond to this stimulus, they change their phenotype uh, to nearly the opposite one. And uh, I'm not showing you the complete work, it is uh, very extensive, uh, since we got uh, so many comments from the reviewers, and we had to nearly double the amount of experiments in this paper. I will show you just this graph. Uh, for two markers that uh, we used, one is uh, AMAC1, uh, this is a chemokine and it seems to be an antagonist of CCR3 receptor and well-known TNF-alpha. And uh, so what you can see here that uh, irrespective of the initial stimulation, macrophages do respond to the secondary stimulus in both cases. Uh, but uh, one important point we noticed here is the kinetics of the reaction. So you see that the TNF production is a very nice self-limiting uh, reaction, so we give uh, LPS to these cells, and whatever they were before, uh, they produce a, a boost of um, a TNF, and then they stop doing it. Uh, in contrast to this, um, the stimulation with interleukin-4, note the exponential, the logarithmic uh, scale here, it uh, gives a constant increase of AMAC1 production. So that means that the direction, direction of the inflammation is really self-limiting, and uh, the direction that is now we know that is more or less healing uh, phase or inhibition of inflammation is not self limiting. Uh, so that means we considered uh, this hypothesis uh, confirmed uh, and uh, actually designed uh, the very first uh, concept or how we see the macrophage behavior during the inflammation. So, in the healthy organism, in homeostasis, macrophage uh, is in some kind of a neutral state uh, that is still doing something but uh, not doing anything with the inflammation. When the pathogen and injury uh, comes, the macrophage already in the tissue changes its phenotype, so it is sitting there for this purpose and initiate the inflammatory reaction, can recruit monocytes, they will differentiate also in the similar type of cells and then, after inflammation is outdated, it uh, falls down to the healing phase and finalizes uh, the reaction by bringing the organism to homeostasis again. 
if something goes wrong, then we can go into chronic inflammation. So just uh, speaking a little don't bit in advance, so it wouldn't look like this, it would look like oscillations uh, over here uh, with the median there. And if something goes wrong with the healing phase, uh, we go another way around to fibrotic uh, condition. So and when we started to develop this concept, uh, we actually decided to uh, consult with mathematicians. And uh, we went to uh, one of the colleagues uh, of uh, Lipnatsky, uh, who made the, the very first model of uh, NF-kappa B, uh, signaling model in the cells. So uh, I think I don't need to explain much about NF-kappa B. Uh, whatever you go or you, you work on in immunology, you will have NF-kappa B somewhere. Um, so the, this factor is activated by uh, different uh, stimuli, so Lipnatsky used uh, TNF stimulation and the signaling uh, cascade is uh, uh, relatively simple, so in 2004 uh, he used the simplified uh, cascade, so TNF uh, activates the EKK uh, that removes EK beta from nf kappa b and kappa b can go to the nuclei and uh, activate transcription uh, of <coughs> several factors. Uh, that uh, can either be effective factors or can be a feedback uh, loops. So he used from the very beginning the uh, system of ODEs uh, and actually uh, I'm not also not going show, to show the complete model of him. Uh, he showed this very nice uh, oscillator, uh, oscillations uh, in the behavior of the system. So what was very impressive uh, for me, for example, the free nuclear nf kappa B, it's uh, oscillates and then stabilizes on a certain level. Uh, so this looked a little bit similar to uh, um, the suggestion we made to inflammatory reactions. So we decided to try to model the LPS uh, response. Uh, now one more point to the Lipnatsky model. Uh, he needed, so any mathematician needs some uh, biological data to generate a model. So uh, this is the data he used. Although he writes that the events of the nf B signaling, especially in the cytoplasm and the nucleus, are uh, minutes events, uh, and this was the most of the data he had. Uh, so some time courses uh, of the free nuclear nf B, B, not on cytoplasmic, so it's only you can see on this blot. So the data that are produced here are not uh, easy to quantify, they are not very good to quantify, and uh, the time courses, especially if you look, for example, on the bottom pictures, um, the, the time steps are really big and uh, if you go to the second set of data then this is a very typical biological experiment, you take 36 and 90 minutes, nobody cares what happens in between, uh, so usually in this case uh, all the fine uh, dynamics of the system is lost. So what we did uh, by ourselves, so we uh, used more or less the model of enough kappa B to model this part. Uh, we added uh, the LPS step and we added uh, the feedback that uh, goes outside of the cell. Uh, so, in, altogether in uh, this system we do have uh, five, at least five feedbacks, uh, feedback mechanisms. Uh, one is uh, via A20, the next one is via newly synthesized uh, I kappa B, third one is the inhibition of TNF alpha translation, uh, then induction of interleukin 10 by uh, nf kappa B that uh, inhibits by the uh, next signaling step and also another one feedback by TNF itself. Mm. So we used also the uh, ODE system, I will not go into very detail, so uh, the modeling was done by Anna Maciniak, uh, the colleague of Lipnatsky. Um, so we used the concentrations uh, of the factors that are uh, analyzed and uh, did it with MATLAB, um, so very simple way. Uh, but when we started to run this modeling and the experiments, we, we found that uh, actually the experimental system is not good enough. So when we culture the cells just in the flask, so we started initially with the primary cells and then we got variability that was too high to model, then we switched to a cell line that was uh, more or less okay, but as when we couch it in the flask, uh, it gives some very strange effects. So we had to um, 
change it to a constant mixing at a relatively high speed so that we have always the even concentrations of all the octaves that are secreted. Then we had to add pretreatment with interferon gamma to amplify the effect of LPS. And then we had also to work with the concentration of LPS to achieve uh, more or less consistent results. So that is not too much and not too little. Um, the sample collections we did, we were collecting three hours every 10 minutes, two hours every 20 minutes, uh, then three hours every hour, 24 and 48 hours to get some kind of a, uh, infinite uh, time point. Uh, we were able to measure these three parameters, A20, mRNA, TNF, mRNA, and soluble TNF. So it's uh, not much, uh, but it was only a quite substantial amount of work taking into account the number of data points. Uh, the model that was done, uh, it had 18 uh, ODEs and 42 parameters. And uh, when we ran the uh, test of sensitivity uh, of the model, uh, the stability of the model, we found that eight parameters uh, are critical for the model stability, and most of them are, were actually in uh, in the areas where we were able to measure the variables, uh, to, to measure um, uh, parameters in, in the experiment. So this is the fitting of the model to the experimental data. The solid line is uh, the simulation, and the dotted line is the experiment. Uh, so. Uh, here, so this happens that when I saw that experimental data really showed the oscillations and they were quite reproducible from experiment to experiment, uh, I really realized that uh, bi biologists should be a little bit more uh, precise or a little bit more careful in their experiments and look whether uh, this can uh, has an important meaning for the complete system and has to be taken into account when developing some therapeutic strategies. Uh, so, the, the main problem that we had here, so the A20 and TNF mRNA, they were fitted relatively well and it also corresponded to the model of Lipnatsky, uh, so we didn't have any oscillation in the soluble TNF protein since uh, probably we do not have, or we did not consider some extracellular mechanisms. So, the uh, problems that we identified during this work, uh, first of all, the variation of the measured TNF production was still too high. And uh, the second problem, and mainly, uh, I think it is the major problem for many such projects, uh, that we can measure two lethal variables. So there were some improvements suggested, um, or some additional experiments, uh, so not to the mathematical part, but to experimental. Uh, but at this time point, uh, so Anna went to a different department, switched to stem cells, that at that time point was more interesting, and uh, the project was uh, slowed down significantly, so we did not uh, make much progress uh, since that. Uh, but uh, still, um, we kept on working on macrophages uh, theoretically, and uh, just to give you a little bit more idea about uh, the complexity of uh, this cell type, uh, if we go into deeper detail, I'm just taking one receptor uh, that is involved in macrophage function control stability in one, under this single receptor, uh, it's not only signaling, somehow we still don't know how, but it is also regulating the vesicular transport in macrophages. So the signaling by itself, uh, it is, uh, seems to be relatively simple to model, but as soon as we go to the vesicles, uh, then it really uh, becomes very complex. And this might be a very interesting model for this, since this receptor is uh, controlling the trafficking of, uh, of uh, new substrates from Golgi to secretion, it can take something up from the outer space and bring it to degradation. It can also uh, take something from outer space, bring it to storage vesicles, and initiate secretion at a certain time, time point. And it also recycles by itself in a relatively complex uh, manner. Uh, so what we expect uh, from uh, such approaches, from usage of mathematics in uh, biology, and especially in macrophage biology, First of all, together with mathematicians, uh, we would like to design an experimental system uh, that will allow a collection of reproducible data that is also useful for the uh, mathematical modeling. Uh, then we have two big blocks. One is for intracellular signaling and one is for vesicular transport that has to be modeled. Uh, then we can generate a model of cellular response to stimuli, identify the model 
sensitivity and identify the hubs. And then from these hubs, we can go to selection of therapeutic uh, strategies and maybe for searching for uh, uh, some individual uh, patient responses so on the basis of polymorphism analysis together uh, with the system. Uh, okay, this work uh, was done mainly in Germany. Um, I would like to thank uh, the members of my group, uh, also the group of Professor Krzyzkowska, who worked on the Vizikama transport, and uh, also Professor Maciniak, who did all the mathematical work. Thank you. Okay, good, good morning, and well, everybody. Uh, I'm, I'm the one keeping you away from the coffee break, so I'll try to be brief. But before I start, uh, should, uh, I should thank the organizing committee for giving me the opportunity to attempt for the first time to Riga and to present my, my work here that I've been doing in the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. So my background is on statistics, mathematics, immunology, genetics. So in this kind of blend of different background, uh, I come up with this idea of you need to, to tackle a complex disease, you need to have different knowledges. So I'll, I'll try to give you what, I, what we've been doing in terms of a little bit of immunology, a little bit of epidemiology, and a little, little bit of mathematical modeling. So it's very simple. I think the talk everyone will, could, can follow. But if you, there's nothing, if there's something that you didn't understand, feel free to ask me in the end. So before we start, I just give you like two two um, two quotes that I al always like to put on my presentations, uh, even for a mathematical modelers. One is the Occam razor, which is gives you the you know if you have uh, multiple theories, you should always keep the simplest explanation. <laughs> so in that sense, we always try to give you the the, the simplest uh, among all the comp competing theories. And another, another quote is from a statistician, which is a kind of a disclaimer of all the mathematical models that I'm going to show you. So all the models are wrong, and, but some are useful. So the models that I'm going, going to show you are useful, but I know from the start that actually the models are wrong. Okay? So a little bit about malaria. So malaria is caused by a parasite, uh, a parasite of the species Plasmodium. So you have a lot of them, so we have Plasmodium falciparum, Plasmodium vivax, Plasmodium ovale, malaria, and nausea. The most lethal, for, or the lethal uh, parasite is actually falciparum, it actually can cause cerebral malaria. And so the transmission, uh, the transmission of the disease is actually depicted on, the, on your left hand side the diagram. So you have a, actually a mosquito that actually is infected by the parasite that bites a human host and then transmit the parasite. So the dead parasite goes to the liver stage and it develops over there and then it's released to the, to the blood and then you have the blood stage where actually you have the most of like the, the clinical symptoms. Okay? So this is important to know in terms of epidemiology because if you want to, trans if you want to stop transmission in the population you need to actually to have this diagram on your, on your mind. Okay? <laughs> So when I, when I talked about uh, malaria to non-academic uh, you know, uh, non uh, audience, they always ask me this question. Oh, you guys are doing epidemiology right in the London school, so is it time for malaria eradication? And I, I would say, well, maybe we are close to eradication, but in, for now we have more like short to intermediate goals to actually to target some countries on the cusp of, of, of malaria elimination and then think about eradication. Okay, so how can we actually can stop malaria? Um, so first of all, uh, you can have, you can treat people when, they, when you see that actually they are infected by the parasite. You can distribute bed nets so that you can stop the mosquito transmission. Uh, you can also apply mosquito vector control, you mean like insect spraying in you know, houses, or you can sometimes you actually can change people's behavior to actually to decrease transmission. Sometimes people do like 
that kind of like risky behaviors in the sense of going to a forest or going to the jungle where actually they are more exposed to the parasites. So if you tell them not to go so often, sometimes it's you decrease just in transmission by, by that. So last year it was released this, uh, the World uh, Malaria Report, and I'm just going to give you a little bit of the, 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 the highlights of the report so in terms of eradication and elimination of malaria. So it hasn't been a, a really strong effort uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the world to actually to control and reduce the malaria cases. So this data uh, relates, uh, um, relates uh, malaria cases on your left, and this is the malaria death on the right. And the, uh, the, actually the time series that, you're going to, that you see is between 2000 and 2013. So you see there is a decreased trend in both the uh, um, time series. So a reduced malaria cases and also a reduced malaria death. But we are not close to the elimination yet. Okay. So you've seen, you've seen a reduction throughout the world, but actually the reduction has not been homogeneous, actually it's been very heterogeneous. So in the areas where actually you can, areas in blue or dark blue and light blue is actually the, actually the countries where actually you have the highest reduction in malaria, uh, malaria, malaria cases and mortality. Okay, and in sub-Saharan Africa you actually have a moderate decrease, but actually it's, it's a, a, a decrease around 50%, 50 to 25%, okay. What's actually the current situation uh, worldwide? So the Plasmodium vivax, which is a, almost like a mild form of the disease, is more or less, more or less like just focus on South America and Southeast Asia, and actually the cases uh, are not so, well, the number of cases is not so high. So this is the, the world map using a parasite prevalence, which is going to be important for the rest of the talk, but I'm going to define that later. Okay, so this is the case of Vivax. In the case of falciparum, which actually more world spread, you can find it almost like in the most of, in South America, especially in Brazil. You have like in Sub-Saharan Africa and you have in Southeast Asia. So the blue colors actually means that they actually it's low transmission, low, uh, is a low transmission setting. And if you go for more like heated colors, like yellow or red, it means that actually it's high transition, okay? So the epidemiologists, to tackle most of the malaria transmission in the field, they use this measure called the parasite prevalence. Uh, so it's no more than, no less than just the proportion of infection in the fields in the population at a given time point. So what you do, you go to the field, collect a bunch of samples, and you see actually if the individuals at the parasite in the blood, okay? So the pros of this approach is that actually it's easy to calculate, it's very intuitive to, in to interpret. Usually to actually to detect the parasite in the blood is very easy to do, so it's, you have like rapid diagnostic tests that can be used in, uh, in actually very challenging settings, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa where actually the heat is so, ho so high that you know, you, can have, you need to have like diagnostic tests that you cannot like just go to waste because of the heat, you know. And and then, but then you have problems. With, we have other problems. So the, one of the biggest problems is that actually the the, the rapid uh, the diagnostic tests are effect, affected by sensitivity and uh, sensitivity and specificity of the of the of the test. Uh, sometimes you it's unreliable when actually malaria transmission is uh, seasonal. And what I'm going actually important for this talk, and especially for malaria elimination, is might not be this parasite prevalence might not be informative in low transmission settings. So, and to convince you that, I brought two examples. One that I actually worked closely. That was a, a, actually a study conducted in an Amazonian region of Brazil. This is in the Pará state, and so the people collected. Uh, data from seven different sites in this Amazonian region where actually you have, according to the world map, is low transmission setting. So if you go, 
So the data is showing you, so this is the different sites that actually were the, the, the where we conducted the study. Uh, you see that actually the parasite prevalence is quite low. So if you want to distinguish the sites, if they are actually more or less malaria in the area, it seems like they are more or less the same, right? Another example is coming, actually, a more extreme example is in the case of Somalia, which is in East Africa, is on, in on, uh, over here. Um, and you see it's also a low transmission setting. See, this was conducted actually in the, in, in the dry season and in the wet season. You have more than, uh, I think it's more than 1,000 individuals and they run their rapid diagnostic tests on blood samples taken from individuals from these populations in Somalia and as you can see over here nothing was found okay it seems like in this specific population there's no malaria right so that comes that comes the three musketeers story into play uh, because if you want actually to stop malaria, you need to think a lot more broadly. And you, we heard about the immunology, and immunology is good, to, for example, to develop antibodies against malaria parasites antigens. But in this specific setting of malaria eliminations, it brings you some unexpected application, which is you actually can track down malaria transmission intensity if you use data from the field, collected by an epidemiologist, but then you need to use mathematical models to extract that information, okay? So, in this case, you have another mosquito, which is the mathematical and statistics, which gives you a set of tools to analyze that data, okay? Of course, the, first, the, the third mosquito is epidemiology, is actually how you can achieve elimination in a, or at least reduce uh, you know, malaria cases in the in a, in a given population. So, epidemiologists think in terms of design of optimal control and emulation programs, but they are also interested in estimating the current uh, malaria transmission and to, and to detect intervention effects. Okay, so all of this together is actually when you, actually is when you have information about what's going on in the field. So, what about immunology? Well, I'm not going to tell you the story about antibodies, and actually they were, they were discovered uh, about, in this case, in specific in malaria, but I'm just going to tell you that, you know, there's also there's, uh, antibody protection when you have a malaria infection, and you have specific, uh, actually, antibodies that can be used uh, because they target surface, surface proteins on the, on the merozoid uh, merozoid surface which is the, the, the parasite form in the, blood, in the blood stage, okay? So you can use antibodies, you can use those antibodies to see actually if people have been exposed to malaria. That's the trick over here. So, in the end, so what you have is data, what we call sort of seropositive data, where you have antibodies, the type, the antibody titus, that you're going to divide into kind of a binary outcome, where you're going to say that people are seropositive or seronegative, according to a given threshold. So the interpretation in an epidemiologi epidemiological setting, a seronegative individual means that he was not exposed or has been exposed uh, a while ago. A seropositive individual is actually that uh, it was or it's currently infected or recently exposed, okay? So the first question is to, when you analyze these data, is actually often how can you define a low antibody level? And so you come with statistics and mathematical modeling to answer that question. So you have this distribution, which is the antibody titus or normalized antibody levels. You're going to assume there are two pop latent populations, to a one is, which is the seronegative, and in the other one is, is the seropositive. And you're going to fit a, a Gaussian mix, a mixture model to the log antibody data, because these, these populations, this is, a, this is like in a no, uh, this is like in a linear scale, but when it's transformed to a log scale, it becomes like a, this beautiful bell-shaped curve that you actually then can apply this model. 
After defeating this Gaussian mixture model, you apply the so-called the three sigma rule that people actually use in quality control. So the three sigma rule in this case is that you're just going to calculate the cutoff for the antibody, for the antibody levels, um, in relation to the seronegative population. So it's mean of the seronegative population plus three times the standard deviation of that population, of that uh, antibody distribution. Okay, and if you do that, you can actually calculate what's called the seroprevalence, which is the, how many individuals actually are seropositive in the population. So if you do that in the Brazil data, so on the, on the left hand side you have the, the, the parasite prevalence, which is, doesn't, seems like it doesn't give you a lot of information, but when you calculate the seroprevalence, it seems like you actually have a gradient of the different sites. So you have a better description just by looking at antibodies, okay? So that's what you have on the right hand side. So the different, I ordered the sites according to the seroprevalence, which is the, 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 a different order from the parasite prevalence, okay? So it, now it's giving you more information about exposure, malaria exposure on the specific populations. If you go back to the Somalia data, that actually was a striking example of no malaria cases in the sample. Actually, this is the, the two, uh, so I, the, the here we combined the, the seroprevalence of two, um, uh, two antibodies for MSP and AMA1. And actually you can, you actually can see for P falciparin infection, you have like 10% of individuals that actually have been exposed. 21 on a, a different town on, on another village and 20% on another village. So it seems like people have actually been exposed, but you didn't know when you actually conducted this, the sample. Okay? So if you go to the Vivex, it's more or less the same. Actually, the people have been exposed around 16% to 20%. Okay. So, so a little bit of the malaria, uh, malaria history in Brazil. So Brazil was an interesting case because uh, malaria was not so strong in, in, the, in the country, but because in the, in the 80s and the 70s there was a huge migration of people going to the, to the Amazonia region looking for a better, or a better jobs, mostly in gold mining extraction. So they went to the jungle and the parasites were there, they didn't have any people to infect, now the people that were there, and so they increased the number of malaria cases in the 70s and the 80s. But then the Brazilian authorities actually came about that actually there was this outbreak of malaria in the Amazon region, and they could start controlling the start controlling malaria over there. So you're going to see that you have that increase. Well, this is a a little bit weird because it's yes, Vivex and falciparin, but what I'm actually going to focus is on fal falciparin, which is the most lethal form of the disease. So if you just focus on, on the red line, you're going to see that it increases until 88, and then it starts decreasing after that. So this is a, an effect of actually coming from the malaria control program that started at that time. Okay? So the idea was, I show you the data from Brazil, and actually you have the age of individuals. So what if you think, okay, so I'm going to skip this. And so imagine that now you have the data set, and now you know the age of individuals, and then you plot the age of individuals against the seroprevalence. So each dot over here represents the seroprevalence of a given age group. Okay, it's not one data point only. So it's, a, it's I'm pulling the data of different age groups. Okay, so I divide it in quantiles of the distribution. Okay, so you will see that actually the that when you when, when the age increases, the seroprevalence increases. So it seems like a little bit like a buildup of immunity, right? So in this case, if you assume that age is like a kind of a surrogate of time of the time of kind of a malaria dynamics model, you actually can estimate what was the malaria transmission throughout this time, okay? And the way you do it, again, is bringing mathematics into play. So you have a very simple model, which people transit between seropositive and seronegative states. 
And then, so you start, you're born as seronegative, and you then you seroconvert with a given rate, we call it lambda, to, and then you become seropositive. If you're not exposed to malaria, you're going to lose those antibodies, because malaria is, unfortunately, you get, it just get, you get only partial immunity. Uh, so then you, have, if you don't even get exposed to malaria, you're going to lose those antibodies and you, you're going to revert to a seronegative state. Okay? So if you do this in a, math, in a, in a mathematical way, with Markov chains or a, a stochastic differential equation, you're going to end up with very simple models, well, not very simple, but at least manageable for mathematicians or for statisticians. So the most simple example is to think is like actually the transmission was constant throughout time, okay? So the zero conversion rate remained stable throughout the years, as well as the zero reversion rate. And if you do this model in this in the Markov chain um, um, formulation, that's the formula you're going to get. So it's a very neat curve. Okay, that saturates at some point. What actually is more important, more interesting for the immunologist, is actually when you have, a, you have a program, an intervention in the field, and then you want to actually to see if there was a, 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 actually an effect of that intervention. Okay, so in this case, you had like a zero reversion, zero conversion rate that was high in the past. Then there was an intervention in the field and that will decrease the zero conversion rate to an, another level. For simplicity, you assume that actually the zero reversion rate remains constant throughout time. Okay? So if you do that, you actually need so the curve of the, the, the zero preference curve adjusted for age, actually it, it cuts in two parts. So individuals that were born before the intervention and actually the individuals that were born before the intervention, so they will have different dynamics. That's why it looks, it's, there seems like a discontinuity here. So a kink in the curve, like we used to say. Okay? So the, mathematic, the mathematics is slightly, it, it complicates it slightly, but it's, easy, it's manageable to do. Uh, and that's what you get. So you can then uh, use these models to estimate the zero conversion rate, which gives you, or it's, it's like a proxy of um, uh, the force of infection on that population. So coming back to the Brazil data, so in the case of the blue, uh, the blue curves are for for the Vivax. So it seems like the, the mal malaria transmission. <coughs> Sorry, remain stable throughout the years, which actually is compatible to the plot that I show you about the, the malaria cases in, the, in Brazil. And in the case of falciparum, it seems like there is this kink in the curve in most of the sites, which actually happened like 30 years ago, which actually co uh, is, is more or less in agreement with actually the malaria programs that started in, in, the, in, that, uh, in that region. Okay. For the Somal in the Somalia case, it seems like the transmission remains stable throughout the years, but the, the, the actually the behavior of the, of the curve. If you see the data points, it seems like the fit is not like so good. Uh, so it seems like you don't have power to detect any change in transmission. So the so the conclusion is that. For the simple explanation, you keep the constant malaria transmission. Okay, even that it seems like you may have something in the data. So the take-home message, I don't know how much time do I have, but just the take-home message. So epidemiology provides you this strategy to eliminate malaria. Immunology via antibody data provides key knowledge on past and current malaria exposure. A mathematical model is actually the way that you connect the two things in order to, you know, to derive and reconstruct malaria exposure uh, history of a given population. You can discriminate sites, you can detect hot spots of infection. Oh, and but in, in last, but not least, it's like 
this problem uh, needs to bring other mosquitoes too, because this malaria is a, is a very complex disease, and sometimes you have sociological problems. Even if you want to, you, know, you want to have an intervention in the field, you need to have. Uh, sometimes you have sociological problems, uh, sociological factors that, that don't allow you to do that. You have problems of management, and you have problems of finance and economy, because uh, you know all the interventions cost money. <laughs> okay, so you need to have like cost-effective. Um, um, cost effective interventions. Uh, so the final slide I'm going to show is just the current current challenge that I've been tackling in my in, in my group. So uh, so the study design in terms of study design because you're like in a, in a low, low transmission settings you may think that you can uh, in most like the most uh, correct way of doing surveys is by going to the community and do a random sample. But sometimes it's not easy to do that. So sometimes you need to do like convenient sampling. The, and then you can have like health facility or school based surveys. Uh, you also need to find the best or the most optical sample strategy based on different age groups because, the, because malaria is more focused on, they will, the most of malaria cases actually on young children. Sample size determination. Every time that you design a study, and you, if you want to detect an, 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 an effect, you need to control the precision of your estimates. You want to have the power, you want to know if you have enough power to detect a change in transmission. And most of the studies conducted in the field don't take into account that. And then you have the estimation problems. Sometimes the zero regression rate cannot be estimated from the data. If you let the data tell you, uh, what's, what will be the value for the zero regression rate? Actually, you cannot do that, and that will affect it, the will affect the estimation of the zero conversion rate, and that will give you the wrong impression of a given trans malaria transmission. And finally, is uh, actually when you use like a, like a convenient sampling, sometimes you introduce biases on your estimates. So if you know how to actually to control the bias, you will be in business. And now the acknowledgements, so the people I've been working with, the Chris Drake from the London School, and he's actually my mind manager, um, Maricela Cunha, who actually the our collaborator from Brazil, they collected all the, all the data, and uh, our funding bodies, the Wellcome Trust, Bill Gates Foundation, Fundação Francisco Tecnologia, and of course I would like to thank again uh, Bali Effect for uh, having me here. And thank you for your attention, and I'll take a question. Uh, well, it's a good question. It's, uh, I'm, uh, I'm more like epidemiologist, but it's, it's going to fit. If, I, I know that there are people in Oxford doing a lot of uh, vaccine development. Uh, we are trying to tackle these problems, not with the point of view of vaccine, it's just we try to reduce just transmission. And, and there are, in terms of vaccine development, uh, I, I'll show you the first slide. So actually there are people trying to develop a vaccine, not only to, tr to actually to prevent infection on a given individual, but also to prevent transmission. Because the problem is, is even that you have your immunity and you decrease the, the clinical symptoms, you're going to transmit the parasite to someone else if you have a mosquito biting you. So, so the problem is more, is trickier than that if you want to actually to stop malaria. So, I don't know if I answered your questions. Kevin. <laughs> Must have a question. Yeah. So is this uh, sort of a general approach if you think of uh, uh, checking uh, effectivity of vaccine applications? If you look at this the change in the profile of uh, serum prevalence, is it going up or is it going down? So it actually could uh, reflect uh, different interventions. Yeah. And also it could be used to Multi-day the necessity to prevent. They can influence the vaccine application. For example, I know that such studies are done, but we don't see really publications that would motivate now this sort of profile of 
antibodies in the population going down, now it's time to yeah, yeah. sort of start, start uh, vaccination. Exactly. What, what is your opinion on that? Well, in terms of... Uh, no, the way we see it, like, if you do that, well, first of all, I, there's, like, a specific population in, the, in Africa that actually have higher antibody uh, levels. If you go to Fulani, the Fulani ethnic group, they have natural, more higher antibodies. Um, so, coming back to your question, is that some, uh, if you give the, the, the uh, vaccination, it's going to give an impression that it seems like been, uh, been, people have been exposed a lot. Uh, it will give you an, actually an effect of the of the of the at least of, of the infection itself, but then you lose the the ability to estimate actually the current transmission. So the the idea of the model you can use that for exactly to see if there was that effect that effect of the intervention because you increase the seroprevalence uh, um, by vaccinating people but then you, you lose the capacity to estimate the transmission in the population because it's going to be embedded on that. So you need to be careful with, uh, with the interpretation. It's, you, it's possible but then you lose a little bit uh, about the interpretation. So that you know uh, both of the initial vaccination uh, yeah. compared to uh, initial uh, yeah. take test. Well, and if you can target a specific antigen, you can actually you, you can do this analysis. I, what I spoke was combined analysis of different antigens. But if you do a, a specific vaccination for a specific antigen, you can do an analysis on yeah. on a specific antibodies. And if you do it on a other bunch, you actually you can complement each other the two other two approaches. Okay, yeah. Thank you very much.